bathroom, ventilation and mold. I'm sure you've all seen one of these. Well, that's the topic of today's live stream. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a few things today. I'm going to be talking about obviously bathroom and kitchen ventilation. Some of the problems that occur when you have inadequate ventilation and condensation might form and how this can quickly lead to mould. I'm going to be talking about plasterboard, gypsum, gyprock, call it what you like. How some of the latest research from August 2019 is showing that plasterboard can quickly become colonised with mould and we're going to be focusing on what this research says and what this means for the building and construction industry. We are also going to be talking about some of the public health uh, implications of uh, condensation and poor ventilation. And I'm going to be having an interview with a very special guest who is a former client of mine who I first met a couple of years ago when he was leasing a property in Melbourne. And we're going to be talking to him about his more recent move into state and a new home construction which he undertook with a registered builder. And unfortunately, the moisture ingress and accumulation problems due to ventilation and other factors which are affecting his uh, amenity and potential health impacts of this to himself and his family. And we're going to hear in his own words how he is dealing with this, what his experiences have been, what his recommendations are, and then I'm also going to be talking about the Building Code of Australia and the ventilation requirements for different rooms in the property, what the research literature says, and we're also going to be then wrapping it up with a discussion about something called the air pathway and how this is really important to understand how uh, ventilation and condensation issues are dealt with in your home. And I'll also be wrapping up with some recommendations for you to uh, uh, look for and also to improve uh, your own awareness and understanding of how uh, ventilation impacts on you. Now, I want to now, as I was preparing to um, uh, give this uh, live stream this week, I did a little bit of uh, quick research on the internet yesterday and I looked at uh, a couple of the top news stories that have appeared in the media uh, over the last 24 to 48 hours. And the first one I found was a family in the United Kingdom who are discussing how mold and poor ventilation has impacted on their 450,000 pound property. And the next uh, news story that came up was from Scotland and it focused specifically on a build into a hospital where ventilation problems were highlighted as the big ticket issue in the construction of this new hospital. And, you know, when this makes the news, you know that there's a problem. And then the last story is really a rogue landlord from New Zealand, but it was picked up and talked about in the Australian media. And these particular tenants were uh, uh, blamed uh, for their mould problem. And this was put down to their lifestyle factors and their failure to ventilate the property. Well, look, the judge actually ruled in favour of the tenants and the rogue landlord had to pay damages of some $6,000. So this is the context of what we're talking about uh, today. So what does the research say? Well, I first want to talk about some of the building uh, products that are used in our properties. And the reason I want to talk about that is that plasterboard or gyprock, uh, all the common companies such as CSR and BGC Australia, they actually manufacture 233 million square metres of plasterboard. So plasterboard is a very common uh, wall material that is used in construction. But what does the research literature say about moisture and mould and plasterboard? Well, I said to you that I'd be bringing you some cutting edge research and this publication just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago in August 2019 and they were focusing on the 
types of uh, building characteristics such as the use of plasterboard and their connection with potential health impacts from unwanted moisture. And so these scientists were looking at uh, the topic of biodeterioration, or that is the how this building material that is so common in use in Australia and worldwide, what happens to it when it actually becomes damp? And so they were looking at the this particular uh, issue and they didn't even purposefully seed their samples of plasterboard with known fungi. They just left them exposed to dust and they discovered that there was a huge decrease in the weight of the plasterboard, but also its tensile strength. And it was up to 80% for moisture affected plasterboard, meaning that the plasterboard isn't really fit for purpose in some cases after it has become severely uh, moisture damaged. But how can I show you this to demonstrate the severity of the problem? Now, if I take one of their figures from their paper out, we can quickly see that in the top row of photographs, they sterilize the plasterboard with ultraviolet light. And you can see that there's no mold growth occurring in these sterilized samples of plasterboard. But in the bottom panel, these were left out for four weeks, exposed to dust to inoculate the plasterboard with viable fungi or molds. And you can see all the red arrows that are pointing to the hyphae or the mycelium, the fungal cells that are found growing on this plasterboard. So this is what happens under the microscope or under the scanning electron microscope in these photographs when the plasterboard becomes wet. Now, what did they conclude? Well, these scientists concluded a couple of things, that there is a critical need for multidisciplinary groups to be developed to optimize what is a healthy building. And that's a complex way of saying that there needs to be uh, an increasing diversity of stakeholders discussing these building related problems which impact on the uh, uh, tensile strength and the integrity and the fit for purpose of plasterboard because it does in fact become moldy very quickly. And in last week's live stream, we focused on these cellulose loving fungi and they love plasterboard because it is a composite building material. And their other conclusion was that there needs to be a catalog of known triggers that cause fungal growth indoors, such as plasterboard condensation and as we're going to be focusing on this issue of ventilation and what type of ventilation requirements are uh, really to be expected to minimize problems indoors. And also issues like carpet, the presence or absence of carpet and its relationship to moisture retention and, and that sort of thing. And so their take home conclusion is that there also needs to be a catalog of practical strategies for optimizing indoor living by working out what are the best cleaning methods for the indoor living environment and also what emergency management measures or procedures need to be followed when a home takes on inadvertent or unwanted moisture after a flood or simply when the property has huge indoor condensation problems. Now, if we look at some further research, because I've started off talking about how the building takes on mold, but what about what happens to the people who are living inside the building? And so I want to highlight this particular paper, which came out uh, some years ago in 1998. And this is Australian research. And the scientists were looking at 80 households with 148 children aged between seven and 14 years. Now, 36% of them actually had uh, known or diagnosed asthma. And what they did is that the scientists went in and they actually measured the amount of mold, the viable mold that was found in the airspace. And what they did is they investigated these levels in the bedrooms, the living rooms, the kitchens, and the outdoor, which is the reference control. And what they discovered that the higher the level of viable airborne fungi, 
that this was associated with limited ventilation uh, through open windows, fewer extractor fans being present in the building, and their failure to then remove uh, indoor mold growth when it occurs. So when you see it, you need to affect source removal, and also musty odors are strongly associated with an increase in uh, uh, viable mold, and obviously a history of water intrusion. So all of this is common sense, but it definitely points the finger that poor or inadequate extraction fans contribute to uh, mold problems and affect people's health. Now, if we look at even uh, uh, some older research now looking at the relationship between the building layout and the buildup of condensation in a property, we discover that the two most important criteria are the position of the bathroom and the kitchen. And the reason for this is that these two areas of the home are intermittently occupied and they also experience the largest changes in moisture level uh, into the air. And so therefore that water vapor can condense out onto cold uh, walls uh, uh, quite quickly. And it's also uh, important to be aware that uh, bathrooms produce approximately one quarter of the moisture in comparison to kitchens. Now, their conclusions were that extractor fans reduce the moisture content in the air by dilution and also by dehumidification. And so other measures that increase the temperature of the room, such as heating, also contribute to a reduction in condensa condensation or reduction in the indoor humidity of the property. And this can be achieved by either increasing the temperature of the home indoors or by improving the wall insulation and perhaps the roof and floor insulation as well. Now, what does the Building Code of Australia say? Because this is uh, uh, really the document which is referred to to uh, 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 dictate what needs to occur within the built environment within Australia. And so there are various different ventilation requirements for Australia, and I urge you to consult the original documentation uh, and also consult with a uh, independent building inspector. Uh, but I want to summarize uh, from my perspective what some of the key uh, components of the Building Code of Australia and how this impacts on the microbiology of the built environment. Basically, it states that rooms need to have at least 10% of the floor space. You need to have windows in your building. Now, for bathrooms, you need a fan which is capable of achieving an extraction capacity of at least 25 litres per second. And your toilet or WC also needs to be at 25 litres per second. And kitchens need more than that, as the research tells us, and that needs to be set at at least 50 litres per second. And the laundry needs to have an openable window and to be at least 5% of the floor space. Now, I've done many inspections in apartment buildings where there is a Euro laundry or some other arrangement of uh, laundry facilities put into ensuite bathrooms, and often the ventilation requirements appear inadequate, and uh, really that's something that you should be aware of as well. Now, as I said, please consult the original uh, documentation or consult with a registered building engineer to give you expert advice. But if I drill down into some of the uh, standard uh, uh, paragraphs, we can find examples which I see all the time, and that is extractor fans which vent directly into the roof void. Now, this is permitted in some circumstances under the building code, and if the uh, uh, roof is tiled and there are air gaps around the tiles, then it is permissible to have the uh, hot air, hot humid air going directly into your roof void and escape via the eaves, roof vents, or through the tiles. But I can certainly tell you from experience that when air samples are taken up in these roof cavities, it is all too common to see huge levels of mold spores. And this is a combination of the hot, humid air out of the bathroom and sometimes the kitchen escaping directly into the roof void and then condensing out onto the porous insulation 
and or rainwater coming in through these gaps that the building code specifies in their document are, are used for the escape of uh, uh, warm air. So if you have intrusion of moisture uh, through your tiles and around the gaps and that hits your roofing insulation wheel, obviously you're going to end up with a hidden mold problem in the roof board. Now, where can things go wrong? Well, they can go wrong in loads of places. What I want to do now is I want to play you a, uh, a pre-recorded interview that I did, as I said, with a former colleague, uh, it's not colleague, a, a client of mine, and he's actually a builder himself. And why this interview was really important is it highlights on not only the uh, emotional reasons for uh, building a new home, his hopes and dreams, but he focuses on his experience, uh, uh, firstly in Melbourne and what type of mold related issues he had. And then when he undertook construction of a new home by another builder who did this for him, he's experienced all these problems and he's gonna talk to you about this. And so, at this point, I'm going to play you the interview and uh, then we will uh, come back uh, to some other uh, information about extractor fans and what you can do yourself. I've got one of my clients on the line. He's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with mould. Now, he's currently having some issues with his builder. He doesn't want me to reveal his identity, so we're going to call him Jack, which isn't his real name for the purposes of this interview. So, welcome, Jack. G'day, Cam. How are you going? I'm really well. Thank you for uh, jumping on this uh, live stream today. I understand that mold's been an ongoing health problem for you and your family. Could you tell me a little bit about this? Because I know I first met you in Melbourne a couple of years ago before you went into state. Yeah, well, the house that you uh, you actually came and tested for me, Cam, was, as we know, was about six times what normal air would be. Um, now, due to living in that house for about three years, um, all my family now suffer thoracics, all all damaged. Um, I've got allergic al uh, alveitis, I think it is, with uh, chronic asthma. Yes. Yeah. Um, COPD. I've been in hospital with it. Um, I basically had said to doctors, look, it's this problem. Here's the air quality test. Oh, no, no, we'll test you for this. So actually only moving into state was the only time I have actually got a clinical diagnosis of the damage that was done in Melbourne. Right. Look, I remember that that was a really serious problem because you were leasing that property, weren't you? Yeah, that was through an agent through, uh, through a, I think Maybe it was a Chinese constabulary. Yeah. No, I won't mention them. I'll probably get into trouble. But, um, yeah, that was through an agent. Most of my houses have been through agents um, and, you know, face the same trouble. I moved out of that place. I moved straight into another one just before Christmas. Two weeks later, found mould in the house. Now, the rental properties these days, the landlords just don't take care of them. They are not willing to do the upkeep to them. You know, and that's something that has to be done when you are faced with water damage, leaky pipes, anything really that's, you know, going to be a big concern, like even condensation on the windows. Um, that that just tells me that there's lack of ventilation through the whole house, you know, either people keeping things closed for whatever reason or, you know, faulty uh, appliances inside the house. Of course, of course. Now, Jack, when you left Melbourne, obviously you've moved uh, to um, Western Australia, I understand. Now, it's a lot hotter over there than it is in uh, uh, Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, you also then undertook a, a building um, project. Could you tell me a little bit uh, yeah. why and ha how you sort of moved out of the rental market into the homeowner market and then w what you thought you'd achieve by building your own property as opposed to renting, considering the health issues that uh, you acutely have suffered and you didn't want to put your family at risk as well. Well, that was that was the whole purpose of building cam was actually to get out and have control of the environment that we're living in. You know, um, in building the house now, I'm pretty much faced with the same issues. So, you know, to get out of the rental game and then into a into a house that I'm actually having trouble with since day dot, 
it doesn't really make you feel that well. You know, you, you've got all these idealistic thoughts of these builders doing the right thing. And yes. we all know the right thing to one person is different to the other. That's acceptable. Yes. But when you have been in um, the rental game for so long, had to deal with all these issues, um, you build a house to get your family well. You build a house so you don't have to deal with these sort of problems. And you build a house because other people have done it for you and they're meant to be trusted to be doing the right thing and a good job to quality. Well, that's not the point at this, at this particular time. I'm fighting with a builder now and have been since literally day dot from a crack slab all the way through. Walls not being right. You know, the place is just basically slapped together in a, in a four or five month period with no care taken. And, and and so you're not happy, obviously, with the builder. Uh, has the local council been of any assistance to you with regard to the uh, planning permit and the building permit? Well, this is the thing. I pulled the council out um, at one point during the build where I wasn't satisfied that the roof construction was done correctly. Uh, I pulled them out. I went through and said, no, well, sorry, that's that's done right to our standard. That's done to Western Australian regulation. And the regulations up here, as I find, are very backdated. Right. Okay. So what sort of water ingress problems have occurred, if any, during the construction? Or what did you note when you, before you actually moved in and took occupancy? Oh, look, I had a flood um, during the build before they'd actually put the roof on. Um, we had about three or four days solid rain. Um, and... Of course, in Western Australia, they put all the eave linings up and they put the garage lining up. Well, the garage lining is AC sheeting and so are the eaves. But again, my whole garage roof was a foot underwater and leaking through all the joins. I had maybe a foot of water throughout the house, uh, mainly in the front bedroom and in the hallway where I'm having most of the problems now. That was only left to dry for about two and a half weeks. Now, it's a brick for near home. And that brick, was air drying? Not gonna drive. Yeah, that was just air drying with the house being open and um, air breeze all the way through. Okay. But then they go and put on concrete render over the top of the uh, of the brickwork. Sure. So in a two-week period, you, you've put two things with moisture straight back into a wall. And that's a budding internal plasterboard, I imagine, of course. Well, that's all then plastered with what they call drywall. Okay, and it's not, a, it's, it's not uh, actually not actually boarded up um, it, as we would on the east coast, but it's the same sort of um, same sort of ingress you would get had you have been had uh, a timber wall that had been um, soaked. You wouldn't let it dry out for two weeks and then put plasterboard over the top because, as we both know, it's just going to increase the mould habitat inside the wall. Absolutely. Uh, now, it's not a steel frame home construction. Is it a timber frame construction? No, full brick. Double brick outside full brick. and uh, gotcha. single brick. Yep. Okay. Full brick home. Um, that's how they do it over here. Um, there are only some builders are just recently now going into steel framing. Um, I do believe that it's not a quality thing or a, um, anything like that. It's just a lot cheaper. Okay. It's just a cheaper way to build over here is to do it in brick rather than timber as they don't have the facilities for the timber pine and everything that we would on the East Coast. Okay. So the during construction, you had uh, rainwater come in and basically soak uh, the, 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 the floor. Is it a single or double-storey home that you've built? I think I've seen photographs. No, only, single, only, isn't it? Yeah, only yeah, a yeah. single story, yeah. Fair enough. And um, so what else has happened apart from the water damage during the uh, construction through the roof? Well, I've had, uh, I've been dealing with mostly um, higher up people rather than supervisor, but since handover, um, just prior to handover, three weeks or so before handover, I got a call from them saying that uh, they had designed the house wrong. They'd put a fixed panel window or had to put a fixed panel window in my ensuite to meet with the regulations of the gas meter being installed, being that the window is only 450 mil away from the gas meter itself. It needed to be a meter. 
So now, due to a design fault, I've now got eight weeks after, eight or nine weeks after moving into my new brand new home, I now have mould growing throughout my house. Now, that's this is the really, really fundamental issue here that I want to zero in on. You're talking about now a, a built-in building defect that doesn't meet the building code. Now, that's really significant, yes. isn't it? Because now, in all your efforts to get away from um, conditions that facilitate or uh, would allow for mould, you've now constructed a new home, and now this one is taking on mould. How do you know it's taking on mould? Um, it's got mould ingress coming through the walls, Cam. So you can um, see it. I've got now, yeah, physically see it on the walls through now, the plaster. So presumably there's a condensation problem occurring. And, and, and which rooms are, are this, is this happening in? Well, it's from the hallway to the front door. Um, now I'm in the house. I leave the front door and the back door wide open so Bruce can go through the house. Since I've been in the house, I've had two defusers running, one in the bedroom. Um, that's all running eucalyptus to kill mould spores in the house. Still, okay. I can't get away from it. So, you know, um, being the fact that they've put a fixed panel window in my ensuite, I now find out later on after I've signed uh, all the documents and whatnot, I ring up an inspector and say, look, I'm having condensation issues in my, uh, in my bathroom. Yes. Went up in the roof. Now I've got a, a uh, non-regulatory fan in my house it's now flumed of course into the uh, outside air but all it's got over is a cow it doesn't have a self-sealing unit which then you know proceeds to stop backflow from the uh, air outside pushing the air back into the room so basically you've got moisture movement that's supposed to go out to the house which could be escaping not only into your wall void but also uh, interfering with the diffusion in and out of the house yeah. Well, that's a disaster. And this, is my, this, and this is a brand new home. So, you know, being that is all, all hopes and dreams out the window. So how many weeks or months have you actually been in here? I probably say about eight or nine weeks. Wow. So in, 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 in two to two and a half months, you've got mould yep. growing inside your house, which notwithstanding the water problems that occurred from through the roof, but the condensation problems that are occurring in the bathroom, you know, look, it's well known from research literature that adjoining abutting rooms to the dominant room with the emission of condensation are going to show 50% of the um, concentration. So if you've got a problem in your bathroom, the abutting rooms are going to show half the problems to the source room and then yeah, the and then adjoining the, rooms to that are 25% of that. So Yeah, and then you've got five people in the house that breathe out nearly 10 litres of oxygen when they're asleep. Water vapour. So you've, yep. got, you've, got, you've got added water vapour in there and every morning I wake up, whether the windows are open or not, I get condensation on my windows in my front bedroom. Wow. I have condensation on my sliding door. I have condensation in my daughter's room, my son's room and my other son's room. So, you know, it's a case of when they actually handed this property to me, the walls weren't set, the plaster wasn't set. I talked to their painter, and this is the builder's painter, and said, well, how do I go about painting the, painting the walls? Do I, can I do it when I get in there? Uh, his words to me were, if you get in here, I would crank up the heaters for a month before you even touch these walls. So they knew that there were problems during construction? Well, being that the plaster hadn't set, sure. um, they knew there was still moisture level inside the plaster. Yes. So then, per se to that, now we have a habitable area for mould to grow, being that in established air or in a confined space, we always have those mould spores, but they're only in a small number you start combining them in a larger area that's under, you know, constant uh, non-air movement due to ventilation issues or anything like that. As you know, we're now harbouring a great area for mould to grow. Absolutely. And what are some of the solutions? Have you been presented with some options? Look, um, I 
Are you able to talk about that at all? Or look, their their option was to put a skylight in my ensuite, right. which I found um, I'll comment quite, on that in a minute. Yeah, quite hilarious because you just what what's that really going to do? They wanted to cut a vent hole in my ensuite door, which then, as looks per se, it doesn't look very nice. Um, in when you're going to sell your house, oh, why have you got a vent in your door? Oh, well, you've got moisture issues in your bathroom. It's not a very good selling point. Um, so I've put it to them that their fans are not uh, adequate enough for the ventilation purpose, being that it's a fixed panel window. There's no breeze through that room to actually assist the fan in uh, reading the moisture out of that room within the five-minute period that a fan should do. No, I completely um, agree with you. Why did they put so, a fixed panel window in? Well, that was due to the mismaintenance in their design at the very start of the house, and this was only picked up three weeks before handover. Yeah, this is just really terrible, isn't it? Because um, obviously there are... Um, building codes and building codes definitely stipulate the amount of ventilation that should be in a uh, bathroom and uh, toilets and kitchens. Um, yeah, it's have... all, all meant to be simulated, I believe, now. On, uh, they simulate it all on a computer, as far as I know. Well, the Australian ventilation requirements are um, reasonably specific and they can be looked up. Uh, and certainly, mm. um, has anyone commented, and again, you know, I understand if you don't want to say anything, but uh, has uh, a- anyone uh, commented on the uh, ventilation requirements that uh, exist currently in your bathroom with regard to the only me when <laughs> Only so, me when I contacted an inspector and he actually viewed the energy assessment uh, report that they'd done for the house. And in the energy assessment under 312.34, it states that it must be a fan with, I believe, to be a seal. So it's it's a backdraft seal that sits on top, um, and the actual vent port for the escape of the air is to the side, not the top. So you've got a backdrafting on there. You could either do it with a filter. Uh, you could put a filter in there, but... All air escape from a room cannot be done with just putting a cowling over the top of a fan. That's n- not an acceptable uh, way because you still have the viable thing of air being pushed back down the duct, nothing at the bottom of the fan to actually stop that progressive air coming into your home. Yeah, Jack, I, uh, I, I follow you completely. Well, look, so you're suffering at this point potential health impact from visible mould. Presumably, if it's visible already on the walls, there are invisible spores present in the home. This needs to be yeah. addressed. There's a potential um, uh, impact on the economic value of your new property, as well as issues of whether or not your property actually meets housing quality standards um, with respect to uh, the fixed window and the you know probability that there's inadequate ventilation coming into your bathroom. Um, that's a, a pretty poor indictment on building uh, 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 building um, practical building works that are going on. Uh, as we speak in Australia, what do you? No, hope it, it, it just this? it just basically shows you that uh, the builders out there are just in it for the money. That's a simple fact. As many houses as they can push out a year in a in a you know in a reasonable time, um, it is just for the money. You know your housing prices over here have come down to sort of invite people to come and buy these new homes, so you've got more structure around certain suburbs and you're invited in by the nice price. Well, for me being um, in the situation I'm in, um, I don't have very many options on the East Coast to do what I've done here. So when it was presented here, yes, you know, it was, it was a dream come true to me. I could finally uh, have security for my family. Of course. Of course. Listen, do you have any final messages that you want others to know? Because I'm sure I'm going to talk to you at length about your existing issues moving forward in the next couple of months. But for people who are tuning in this week on the live stream, uh, what would you want to say to them about if if they find themselves in a similar circumstance with uh, builders? Just don't give up. 
know your rights, do your research, and go to them with 100% accuracy because it leaves no movement. It only leaves them on the back foot and they then have to come up with answers. Your home has a six-year warranty. If it's a brand new home, it's got six years. Anything that they were to change, modify or redesign then after has another six years on top of that. So for my case, if they were to come in and fix all this mould, do the remediation process at whatever cost it's going to do them, and this mould comes back, they're, they're, they're liable for that. Um, and they're liable for the health risks and the health impact that it's going to have on my family being I have to be moved out of the house now for them to fix it. Who's paying for that? What Absolutely. emotional stress has it done on you and your family having to come into a home and then be moved out of it only, you know, a few months after you've then put security into your home? You know, people should just know what they're dealing with, um, even in rent properties. If you see it, mention it to an agent. An agent's got 14 days to rectify that or to take action. If they don't, straight to the, straight to the ombudsman because or VCAT because at a, at a length, it will cause you damage. Even if it's a smallest amount, it won't matter. It's already present in your house. Absolutely. Jack, well, listen, uh, that's been extremely informative. Uh, I wish you well moving forward. Uh, I guess my take on this is that um, uh, I can uh, support what you're saying. You need accurate facts um, if you need to get a independent building inspector to comment and write persuasive uh, commentary and catalogue the building defects. I think that's a mandatory step that needs to be undertaken. I think the health and safety uh, repercussions from unchecked moisture and water damage in some cases may not need to be quantified. Certainly if they're allegations that the mould is not a health risk or isn't uh, going to impact on the structural integrity or the amenity or the health and safety of the occupants, it's at that time that it becomes important to start to measure for mould and indoor air quality. But at the end of the day, I think uh, uh, people should focus on the building defects first, which cause the situation that admits moisture or allows moisture to be retained within a dwelling, and then uh, focus on how that then in turn creates ideal conditions for mould to grow in the house and for that to then become an exposure threat to the occupants. But uh, in summary, I wish you well. I hope uh, you get out the other end of this and that the builders do the right thing and improve your ventilation and uh, I'll talk to you again. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, Cam. Thanks for all your help. No dramas. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. Well, Jack had a lot to say there. He talked about his experience in Melbourne. He talked about his experience uh, having a new home constructed for him and the unwanted condensation and ventilation problems that he and his family are now dealing with. So how many of you out there are frustrated and angry uh, about building defects that have been introduced into your brand new home? If you're angry or frustrated about this, really there are things that you can do. And the, the, this last uh, section or segment of this live stream, I'm going to be talking about this and I'm going to be zeroing in, as I said, about the extractor fan issue. Well, we have to be aware that in any home, there is something called the air pathway. And you need to understand this concept because it is the air pathway that links the source rooms with the other habitable areas or spaces in the property. And as Jack mentioned, and as I've mentioned over uh, uh, every week on these live streams, there are three main sources of damp in housing, and they are penetrating damp. As he mentioned, during the new home construction, rainwater entered through the uh, exposed roof. Obviously, if there's storm damage where you can get penetrating damp, there is other issues of rising damp for older style uh, uh, homes and apartments. And then there is this issue of condensation on internal um, uh, walls and surfaces. 
And so condensation is a huge uh, uh, factor in indoor mold uh, problems. And we need to focus on these extractor fans, and more importantly, the motors behind them, because the extractor fan does several things for you. It extracts contaminants from the property. It prevents migration of the contaminants by drawing fresh air into the source rooms or areas. They reduce odors, and they, importantly, reduce condensation by lowering the relative humidity indoors. Now, the scientists have done some excellent modeling and research, which Jack alluded to, and what this states, for example, is that the layout of the house obviously affects the concentration or diffusion into other adjoining or destination rooms. And so you can uh, think about this in the following way. Imagine that the source room is in fact the bathroom. Well, your adjoining areas are going to show 50% of the concentration of the source room. And then the next abutting or adjoining room is going to show up to 25%. So in a sense, the problems radiate out and this air pathway becomes a very important consideration to map out what is going on in the house. And remember, there could be more than one source problem, especially with uh, uh, increasing um, uh, building towards ensuite bathrooms in uh, bedrooms. Now, recommendations about extractor fans. Well, what I can certainly tell you is that the Building Code of Australia standard at 25 litres per second of air may be okay for toilets, but probably isn't okay for bathrooms and kitchens. And so you should ensure that uh, 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 you, the specifications for your home have a much higher rate of airflow and it should be at least 50 to 100 liters per second and importantly it may be useful to consider installing an air intake grill into the bathroom door and although jack mentioned that it is aesthetically displeasing it does serve a purpose what it does is it draws more air into the room so that you can increase the airflow and movement out of the extractor fan now, remember that it is important to make sure that these fans are exhausting or discharging the air out to the atmosphere. And although, as I mentioned, the building code states that it is possible to discharge the air directly into the roof void, you should refrain from accepting this because it means that a lot of that hot, warm air can condense out onto your porous building uh, insulation and that in turn can become moldy and enter in around the perimeters of downlights and be a huge problem down the track. And I see this all the time. And finally, you want to make sure to match the size of the mechanical exhaust fan to achieve a high level of ventilation. This is very, very important. So what are some of the practical steps that you can do? Well, obviously, uh, the research literature says that if you've got carpets and you've got indoor condensation problems, well, you should uh, vacuum them vacuum regularly with a HEPA filtered vacuum. Similarly, um, you may need to consider mechanical dehumidification and you may need to improve the extraction capacity by increasing the uh, ability of the motor in your exhaust fans to actually extract air and make sure that it is discharging outside. Now, if you are still having problems, even having your concerns um, uh, taken seriously, really go to any electronic store in High Street Australia and purchase from $15 to $30 a temperature humidity sensor and start logging your values when you're living inside your property. There are various different apps that you can connect to various uh, of these electronic devices. And therefore, with that data, you can prove that you definitely do have a humidity problem and that in a sense, you can then uh, demonstrate this to uh, uh, builders or other experts or stakeholders that may be involved uh, with the problem. And finally, if you're not getting anywhere uh, with the uh, health implications, you may need to consider on-site testing to prove that you do have a mold problem as well. 
but as I always encourage my clients, lead with the building defects, then move to the health and safety implications. And really, that is the key take home message that I want to leave you with today. Now, in closing, I'd like to say that if you found this video useful, consider giving it a like, sharing it to your page, or maybe even a group that you belong to. You can contact me at biologicalhealthservices.com.au. We sell a range of do-it-yourself test kits as well at mold.net.au. And finally, this video is going to be available on YouTube later uh, at Dr. Cameron Jones. So anyway, next week I will be bringing you another guest and we will be talking about all things mold and building biology. In any case, thanks for watching and see you next week. Have a great week. Bye for now.